This episode of the Smart Poker Study Podcast is brought to you by my upcoming Rejamming webinar on Saturday, September 17th. Rejamming is a 3-bet shove over a preflop raiser in MTTs or sit and goes. You do this with the intention of steaming his open, the blinds, and the antes. This is an aggressive way to pick up chips when you need them most. To learn more about the webinar and to sign up, please visit www.smartpokerstudy.com slash rejamminguebinar. Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Hey, poker people, got a special Q&A today. Oh, and of course, thank you for all that you do. Sharing the show, asking them questions, leaving those comments, hitting that subscribe button in YouTube. I appreciate all of it. Okay, so on the podcast today, I'm reading an article from ExceptionalPoker.com, and the article is called The Third Factor That Turned Me Into a Winning Poker Player. I Learned to Get Inside the Villain's Head. So Mark Warner over there at ExceptionalPoker.com, he puts out weekly articles all about poker. His goal is to turn beginning poker players into stone-cold winners. So I want you to head on over to ExceptionalPoker.com and check out all the poker goodies that he has to offer. And let me tell you, it is a ton of stuff. He's got articles about tactics and strategies, tilt management, donkey test questions, and strategies for tournament poker and cash poker as well. Mark knows what he's talking about, and you should be able to learn a lot from his blog. While you're there, make sure to sign up for his newsletter and let him know that this guy sent you. So about this article, I was thoroughly impressed. It's all about understanding the logic that your opponents are using in their decisions. They may be doing stuff that seems totally idiotic to you, but as long as you can understand why they do what they do, you can use their tendencies to exploit the crap out of them. And to attain this understanding of your opponent, it takes some focus and lots of paying attention. At the end of this article, one of Mark's readers asked a great question. So I figured I would take this opportunity to answer it for myself. Yep, don't mind if I do. And as the title of the article says, uh, this is the third in a series of articles all about the factors that turned Mark into a winning player. Part one was about the results don't matter mindset. Part two was about learning to hate being out of position. And part four, which came out already last week, uh, it was about the power of aggression. Okay, so let's get to the article. Make sure you hit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, including links to the article, to ExceptionalPoker.com, and of course, everything else I mentioned. Go to www.SmartPokerStudy.com slash pod92 for the show notes. And while you're there, sign up for my own weekly boost newsletter for exclusive strategy content delivered directly to your inbox. And now for the article. The third factor that turned me into a winning poker player, I learned to get inside the villain's head by Mark Warner at ExceptionalPoker.com. The article starts with a quote from Oscar Wilde. It says, The fatal errors of life are not due to man's being unreasonable. They are due to man's being logical. The third major thing I did on the road to poker profitability was learning to get inside my opponent's head. More specifically, I realized that the bad guys all use logic. No, it may not resemble my own brand of poker logic, nor may it even be close to good poker, but it's still logical to them. Except for perhaps the most ignorant level zero player, all opponents have reasons for the plays they make. Yes, even the drunk maniacs. If you can figure out what the bad guy is thinking, you're going to crush their souls at the poker tables. The what's lead to the why's. Whenever someone does something, anything in poker, they're doing so for a reason. It may be a bad reason, but they're doing it for a reason that makes sense to them. They might play any two suited cards because they think they can't win if they don't play. And two suited cards looks pretty. Or they might play jack eight offsuit out of position because the cards look strong to them. Or they might call out of the blinds with two weak cards because they feel that they need to defend their blind money or whatever. Our opponents may make plays that you believe are incorrect, but these plays are still based on quote-unquote valid reasons in those opponents' minds. Okay, fine. You might wonder why this matters a whit. People play poorly while thinking they're not. Why should we care? The answer is we should care because this helps us better understand and capitalize on the mistakes of our opponents. Said another way, you have to actively work to take advantage of the mistakes of your opponents, and this starts with noticing those mistakes and interpreting them. Here's an example. 
Jumping Joe raises before the flop from under the gun in a full ring game. You and most of the rest of the table folds, but Joe gets called by Sticky Sam on the button. The flop is 3-8 king with two spades, and Joe fires out again. Again, he gets called. The board pairs with the three of diamonds, and Joe fires again and gets called. The river's the ace of hearts, making the board 3-8 king, 3-ace rainbow. Joe bets again and gets called by Sam, who turns over a pair of red tens. Joe folds jack ten of spades for the flush draw, the flopped flush draw, face up into the muck pile. Everything Joe did in this hand was logical to him. We just don't know yet what that logic is. He open raised jack ten suited from early position in a full ring game. Why? Is it his favorite hand? Does he think jack ten is stronger than it actually is? Is he balancing his range with big suited connectors? Does he think he should play the same hands in early position as late position? Joe also bet hard on the flop and turn with a non-nut draw. Why? Did he think he could bully a tight player off his hand? Does he think Sam is tight? Or maybe he wanted to build the pot in case he hit. Then he fired a big bluff on the river with a scare card when he missed his draw. Again, why? He didn't seem to care what his opponent's range was, or did he? He also seemed to think that folding a missed draw turned bluff face up would serve a purpose. What is that purpose? To show he's capable of playing suited cheese from early position or to mislead them? Or? Similarly, Sticky Sam didn't fold his pair of tens on the flop, turn, or river. He did this in spite of getting bet into on three streets of action from an early position raiser with over cards and a paired board. Why didn't Sam fold? Did he think Joe was super bluffy by nature? Can't Sam read board texture? Is he positionally aware? Did he really think his pocket tens was good here? Why did he call down such a large fraction of his stack? And so on and so forth. Your job, as someone not involved in this hand, is to pay attention to Joe and Sam's actions. Further, you have to not just see what they did, but to figure out why they did it. In fact, the why is more important than the what, but it all begins with noticing those what's. Paying attention at all times. Once you've figured out why an opponent does something that seems like bad poker, you can use this information to your advantage in future tangles with that villain. You can exploit their tendencies and actions because you've gotten into their heads. You begin to understand what their reasons are for doing what they're doing. And you can profit from this knowledge. You can put them on ranges and lines, and that's when poker becomes easy. Far too many players often lose interest in a hand after we've folded. We don't put the remaining opponents still involved in the hand on their respective ranges. We don't try to guess what the remaining players are going to do. We don't try to figure out why someone is betting, or calling, or raising. And in doing so, we're passing up a gold mine of information. My own game took a huge step upward in profits when I started paying attention, especially in situations when I folded. Learning to use this quote-unquote downtime to stay engaged and notice and interpret actions was like taking a quantum step in profitability. Your game can similarly benefit if you stay involved in the game at all times. Remember, everyone plays correctly according to their own definition of correct. We can agree that Jumping Joe probably made some mistakes in this hand, but he probably didn't think so. And that's because he has his own point of view of what's the right and wrong way to play poker. Sticky Sam also made mistakes, but they both had reasons for doing what they did. You just have to figure out what those reasons are. That was a great article, Mark. I fully agree with everything that you said. It's important to understand the opponents at your tables. Even the bad players use logic, however, you know, faulty it might be. If you can figure out what makes them tick, you can create effective lines of exploitation. I think that paying attention to every hand at the table, whether live or online, is important. Lots of players multi-table online, so to make up for this, we use HUDs and poker tracking software to help us understand our opponents better. But you really can't just rely on software to understand your opponents. Paying attention to street-by-street action, bet sizings, and showdown hands is a great strategy that we all need to do. I like the part when he said we need to actively work on taking advantage of mistakes, and this starts with noticing the what's, then figuring out the why. And this actually leads me to my first point I want to make beyond the article, which is about observing mistakes. So the first point is observing mistakes and diving deeper. Sometimes when I observe a mistake, I often say to myself, Oh my god, what an idiot. Then I just dismiss the mistake, label the dude a fish or a donk, and go about my play. But instead of criticizing the player, I would be better served by asking myself, does he know something I don't? 
there are tournament players. Uh, one comes to example, Ape Styles. He will three bet and fold versus certain players with a 14 big blind stack or even smaller. And he does this because mathematically, it's a more positive EV play than just calling the open race. He's been criticized by others for years because it feels incorrect, but he can prove it's a better play with Flopzilla and a calculator. So the next time your opponents make a mistake, instead of saying, that's an obvious mistake, <laughs> go ahead and ask yourself, does he know something I don't? Tag the hand so that you can flopzilla that bad boy later and check out the math and ranges involved. You just may be surprised to find they made a mathematically sound decision. And the player that made the quote unquote mistake, he might not realize this, but that doesn't matter. By doing this analysis off the tables, you're working on your own understanding of the game and how things work, and you'll be a better player for it. You might be able to turn their mistake into a winning play in the future. So remember that question, does he know something I don't? And then the second point I want to make uh, re regarding or in relation to this article is taking useful notes. And that was a great example hand between Jumping Joe and Sticky Sam. It's great that we observed that hand and we learned a bit about the two players involved. But what type of notes could we make that will help us exploit them in the future? So when taking useful notes on players, there are three things I like to include within my HUD in Poker Tracker 4 or even within Evernote on my phone when I'm playing a live table. So the first note I like to make is I like to classify the player type. Maybe it's a lag, a tag, a knit, a station, reg, or something else, whatever it is. I'll classify them by highlighting their HUD stats in a specific color based on their player type. Or if it's a note in Evernote, I'll just type in lag, tag, knit, whatever, whatever the case is. The second thing I like to note is how I can exploit them. And I'll type this within parentheses and in all caps. So for example, in parentheses, you'll see station, don't bluff if they call down super light through the streets. Or maybe, and in parentheses, spewy heads up if they get too aggressive when down to the final two players. Or even in parentheses, I'll type in big bets equals strength. And I'll type this in if they telegraph their hand strength through bet sizing tells. Something else I add are exclamation points to these notes. So if I see three different hands in a row, not even in a row, in a session or just throughout the lifetime playing with a player, if I see three different hands that he made large bets with a made hand, my note would be this in parentheses and all in caps. Big bets equals strength, exclamation, exclamation. So the note accounts for one instance and the two exclamation points mean I saw this same thing two additional times for a total of three instances. The more exclamation points, the more accurate the read. And the third note I make is exact hand details. If I find it necessary to put in the action of a hand to explain an exploit that I typed in, I'll include that. So for the big bets equals strength, exclamation, exclamation note, the shorthand explanation following that might be something like cut off open four big blinds with pocket aces, flop a set, bet three quarter pot flop turn river in position. The shorthand saves space and the explanation might be helpful in future confrontations. So those are the three things I most often note. Player type, how can I exploit them, and exact hand details if necessary. I feel notes are important, so put in as many as you can, but make them useful and actionable. Those are the keywords, useful and actionable. And over time, as you learn more, you'll refine your notes to add to your exploitations of each opponent. So my notes on the example player. So we had Jumping Jack and Sticky Sam. Uh, for, for Jumping Jack, the kind of note that I would make in my HUD is I would color code him orange for being a lag. And then in parentheses, I would type in bluff catch this guy. And maybe the explanation of the hand would be under the gun open, Jack 10 suited, capable of out of position, big bet, triple barrel, semi bluff on a scary King XXX ace board. So that's the kind of thing I would type in to help me understand this appointment, uh, opponent and exploit them in the future. And for Sticky Sam, uh, I would color code him green for being a station. And in parentheses and all in caps, I would type in non-believer in position, go for max value. And maybe as an explanation, I would put in called flop turn and big bet on river on king xxx ace with pocket tens. So those two notes should help me exploit these two players in the future. Alrighty, and as I was reading the article... 
uh, the first comment uh, in uh, at the bottom of the article, it was actually a question from a reader of Mark's named Rob. And then Rob says, excellent post and encouraging too that all this out of hand observation will pay off. I use non playtime to look for tells, but I should probably be observing bet size and approach compared to street and if seen hand strength. I need a poker brain CPU and RAM upgrade. LOL. So uh, he, oh, he continues on any tips for fathoming the logic used by loose lags. I'm hunting for a strategy when out of position to an aggressive lag. My plan is usually to enter with a good hand and let them fire into me. Unfortunately, the cards sometimes don't come. Appreciate your thoughts. So I figured I would take this opportunity to answer Rob's question of my own. And I'm going to answer it with three different lag characteristics. The first one is lags are loose and aggressive by nature. So they like to bluff and blow people off of hands, both pre and post flop. They know that most players crumble under too much pressure, and they use this to their advantage by betting versus the players they know fold too often. So if you're involved in a hand with a lag, you should tend to call more often than not because they're betting more often than not with a weak hand. Of course, you don't want to be calling with a crap hand. You don't want to be calling with a seven high, no draw at all. Uh, Let them just fire and fold it at that. But if you have any kind of equity, whether it's showdown equity or drawing equity, and preferably good showdown equity or good drawing equity, you should be tending to call rather than fold. Alrighty, so another characteristic of lag play is that it takes advantage of position. We all know that being in a position makes it easier to take pots away to go for value or to control the size of the pot. You can use this to your advantage by playing in position versus the lags. Try to avoid calling their opens from the blinds and stick to cold calling in position. So if they open in the middle position, don't call with too wide a range in the blinds, but call in the cutoff and the button. Even if you decide to three bet their open, you should tend to do so in position because if you do it from the blinds, many of these lags will just call your pre-flop three bet with intent of stealing pots away post flop when you check it to them and of course if you've got a tough lag or two or three of them on your table to your left switch seats or leave the table and find a more profitable one and the third thing lags have a much wider range that gets to the flop whether they open the pot or three bet pre-flop They're doing so with plenty of weak hands. You can take advantage of this by allowing them to bluff you down the streets. And you just call with a showdown-worthy hand. You can also steal pots with a bluff raise on the flop or the turn, or even a bluff check raise on boards that could hit your pre-flop range that probably miss an open raiser's range. Alrighty, thanks for that question, Rob. So my big takeaway from this article is the idea of figuring out what's driving the decisions by the players at your tables, whether they're thinking with the same logic you are or some twisted, fishy, gambling, superstitious logic. Once you figure it out, you're one step closer to exploiting them. Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. In the next session you play, make an active effort to watch every hand at the table and make useful notes on your opponents. Typing out hand history notes isn't good enough. Classify them by player type and note how you can exploit them. Now it's your turn to take action and do something positive for your poker game. Now get it on. Thank you so much for listening today, and thank you to Mark Warner and the reader Rob with his question, and uh, that's over there at ExceptionalPoker.com. It's an awesome article. Go check it out. Hit the show notes. Click on the link to read it and the other articles for yourself. And everyone, please let Mark know you enjoyed his article by tweeting him at Bugzilla. That's B-U-G-G-Zilla. Let him know Sky sent you. I want your feedback, so hit me with it through the show notes, or you can send an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Tweet me at smartpokerstudy, or post in the Facebook group at smartpokerstudy.com slash discuss. And please keep those questions and podcast ideas coming in. I love it. Alrighty, poker people, be sure to come back next week for episode 93, where I will discuss three bet ranges in my ongoing MED series. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so I thank you for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.